Okay, I, um, I'm going to switch the next two sessions and reverse them. I'm going to do how to handle opposition uh, now, and then do how to draw a crowd after that, just because that's the way I wrote it in my notes. So I was preparing my heart for the opposition. How to handle opposition in the open air. Uh, first of all, if you are going to witness for Christ, you will face opposition. Uh, Brother Dean can tell us stories of opposition he's had in the past year and a half as he began preaching. And especially new preachers will have opposition because the devil wants to shut you down. So in your case, opposition should encourage you. That's how you handle it. Let it encourage you. That if you're not rattling the beehive, then you're not going to be stung. So if you're not bothering the devil, he's not going to attack you. And if he's attacking you, you must be a threat to him. I see, and I'm concerned, and I worry about if I'm preaching and there is no opposition. If I don't make anyone angry, if nobody wants to shut me down, then how good of a preacher am I? Because Jesus was so good of a preacher, he had angry mobs who tried to shut him down. And if I'm going to be like Jesus, then I ought to have the same experiences that he had. And this world is full of Jesus haters, Jesus mockers. And if a world that mocks Jesus doesn't mock me, then I must not be like Jesus. And so when I'm uh, opposed by the world and trying to shut me down, I just use that as an encouragement, that I'm doing my job, that I'm being like Jesus. So don't let opposition in discourage you. That's the tactic of the devil. He's trying to discourage you. But God says you ought to be encouraged. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Now, I've had a lot of opposition. Uh, you know, I have been punched, kicked, pushed, spit on. Sarah can tell you uh, some of the opposition she's had uh, out preaching. Someone puts some filth in a bottle and pours it on your shoe. And you never wear those shoes again. A lot like the early days of the Salvation Army. They would go out and preach, and they'd have two coats. They'd go out Saturday night, they'd have one coat, their street preaching coat. And it would get egged, and sometimes they would even be tarred, and they would have bedpans dumped out the windows. And uh, they'd, then when their outreach was done, they'd take that coat off. Saturday night was done, they'd put on another coat, their church coat, so they could go to church. And they, so they'd have two coats, their outreach coat and their church coat. Uh, so there's opposition from the world. I was tackled by Bigfoot one time. Uh, Bigfoot is real. He is a college student in Florida. And he's not a fan of street preachers. And of course, you read the Bible, there's all sorts of opposition, angry mobs and police and... So you have to deal with the police. Sometimes you're opposed uh, by the authorities. And we're going to talk about how to handle that. So there's going to be opposition if you do your job right. And if you're not facing opposition, you're not doing your job right. Uh, we're at war with sin. God is at war with the devil. This is war time. And when you're at war, there's injuries, bruises, wounds, fatalities. You know, a great embarrassment for any soldier is if he comes from the battlefield without any mud on his face, without any blood on his outfit. Imagine a Roman soldier coming back from war without any dents in his sword. What a great embarrassment that would be. And if we get to heaven, without any blood on our face and without any dents in our sword, then that would be a great embarrassment indeed. So there's a lot of uh, oppositions verbally, 
a lot of these uh, people will tell you these things. These are some of the most common objections, verbal objections that you'll have. Now you have to remember that you can be on the offensive or on the defensive. And you have to remember that also when you're defending the faith. Are you simply on the defensive and they're attacking you and attacking you and you're trying to defend your beliefs and defend yourself? You need to also be mindful to get onto the offensive where you're not just being attacked but making attacks, challenging their worldview, challenging their system of thought. And the same goes with objections. Uh, one of the most common objections is, Thou shall not judge. And they state it like it's part of the Ten Commandments. Thou shall not judge. The Eleventh Commandment. And some of them are convinced it's in there somewhere. Yeah. In the, in the book of Second Opinions. Now the Bible doesn't say this, thou shalt not judge. In fact, uh, the Bible says judge righteous judgment. It's not righteous judgment that God condemns, it's hypocritical judgment that God condemns. Having a log in your eye and judging another. Condemning someone for what you yourself are doing. Hypocritical judgment. We're commanded to judge. So that would be the defensive answer. Then you have the offensive. Why are you judging me? I can assure you my judgment is righteous, so don't judge my judgment. See, now you're challenging them. Why are they so judgmental? If you are not supposed to judge, then you shouldn't tell someone that they're judging. Because then you're, then you're judging them. Then uh, we're told nobody's perfect. You're a sinner too. So you shouldn't judge. Well, I was just with Joey at Kalamazoo College up in Michigan. And a lady was saying this. You're a sinner. You can't judge because you're not perfect. Who are you to judge? You can't stop sinning. I said, okay, are, is judging a sin? Oh, yes, it is. And I can't stop sinning? No, you can't. I said, well, then I can't stop judging. <laughs> judging is a sin and you can't stop sinning. I can't stop judging. We all sin every day. I judge every day. I can't help it. I'm only human. I judge. Every day, in word, thought, and deed. You see, so uh, what you can do is to assume their position and show the foolishness of it. As the Bible says, answer a fool according to his folly. Least he be wise in his own deceits. Or conceits. You see, so you assume, okay, let's assume that principle of yours is true. If that principle is true, well, here's some internal contradictions in your own life. This is how that system falls in on itself. You know, like when the people say, well, you can't go around preaching your morality. Morality is relative. It's like, well, uh, why are you trying to tell me I can't shove my morality down someone else's throat? That's your morality. Your morality is that. You shouldn't share your morality. And you're trying to force your views on me by saying I shouldn't share my views. Or they say truth is relative. Well, if truth was relative, then that's a relative truth itself. You know, like Brother Jed Smock will ask, uh, someone says, well, you know, truth is relative. Are you absolutely sure? And I've heard people say the only thing they're, at, they're sure about is that they can't be sure about anything. You see, it's a self-imploding uh, system of thought, self-contradictory. So that's how I try and handle these verbal objections, to assume their principle to be true and show them how it contradicts its own self. Or they say, you're turning people off. Of course, turning people off assumes that they're on. I don't believe that this campus was loving God and serving God until I got here. I came here because I thought they were hating God and sinning against God. And you can't turn off someone who's not turned on. I didn't turn you into atheists. I didn't turn you into sinners. I didn't turn you into God-haters. You did that yourself before you met me. 
So you can't tell me that I'm the reason you're not a Christian. You haven't met me before. And uh, they say this is not being effective. People are not being saved. Now, first of all, you don't take advice from a sinner. They try and tell you this is how you should preach, this is how you should win us, but they're not even one. So how do they know? They don't know anything about salvation. They don't know about how to get saved. They don't know about the fear of God that's involved in the conviction of sin. Don't take advice from sinners about how to preach to sinners. And uh, I do know from experience this ministry is effective. I've seen people right then and there on the spot get saved. Now it is uh, not on a daily basis, but it is on a regular basis. You know, the Bible represents uh, soul winning as farming. You got to plow the field, and that's labor. And then you got to plant the seed, and you got to water the seed, and you have to have the patience for it to harvest. It takes time, and it takes labor, and sometimes many people are involved. I've had people come up to me within the first five minutes of me preaching. Well, how many, how many got saved today? I've only been here for five minutes. I've only been here for an hour. Give me time. This is day one. You know, then you ask them, how many of you saved today? Well, you know, I had one, I, I went to a, a rally, a political rally, and I had a red, white, and blue banner that said, you know, turn to Jesus and live. And uh, I stood right behind the stage where everyone had to look because they had their rally in the public square. And some professing Christians came up and they're like, you know, how many have you saved today? I was like, well, I, I don't know. Nobody that I know of. And they're like, well, you're not being effective. And they tried to counsel me. We're elders at the local church. And try and give this young boy some counseling. <laughs> okay, I, I said, how many did you guys save today? Uh, uh, uh. Well, we didn't come out here to save people. <laughs> I said, well, at least I'm doing something. You're not doing anything at all. You're a failure because you didn't even try. <laughs> even if I'm failing, at least I'm you know, trying. Now in the Bible, you don't always you know, see people getting saved. Jesus sometimes made people angry. Jesus had reverse altar calls. Will you also go? You know, Jesus had, uh, he didn't have, like Ravenhill used to say, Jesus didn't have the fastest growing church. He had the fastest decreasing church. From 7,000 to 5,000, down to uh, the, you know, the twelve, and he turned to them and said, will you also go? Jesus turned people off. He offended people. There was a time they said, they came to Jesus and said, the lawyers said, you know, what you're saying to the Pharisees, that's offending us also. And instead of Jesus apologizing, oh, I'm so sorry that I have offended you, he said, woe to you lawyers. He turned and rebuked them. So Jesus offended people, and Jesus turned people off. As far as we know, Jeremiah had no prophet uh, or no no converts. Jeremiah was a prophet, warning Israel about the coming judgment of God, and the judgment came anyways. And the nation did not repent. The only one who seemed to, uh, if you want to say he had any converts at all, he had Baruch the uh, Barak the scribe. But I don't think he was actually uh, someone that was converted under his ministry, but someone that was already serving God. So you don't always have people come to know the Lord, uh, but sometimes you do. I was preaching in the streets of Dallas, and I stood up, and I was trying to preach, and no one was really paying attention, and I'm in the inner city, and I thought, well, I know how to get some attention around here. I'm going to preach against this gangster rap music and, uh, you know, that thug ghetto culture especially as this group of boys were walking by, these inner city kids. And uh, so I start preaching against gangster rap. They get mad at me and uh, offended, and we start debating and arguing over it, and they, they were threatening to beat me up. And I said, uh, listen, you know, these gangster rappers, they're going to feed you garbage and feed you scum because they want your money. They'll tell you anything you want to hear. They don't care about you at all. They don't care if you go and do drive-bys. They don't care if you go to prison. They just want you to buy their records. I'm rebuking the gangster rap, not because, I don't, not because I, I'm selfish, but because I care about you. Because I, I think it's bad for you. And uh, they saw what I was doing, and then they went from wanting to punch me to that all of them wanted to shake my hand and said, I appreciate what you're doing. 
and then they left. And a man apparently had been watching this whole ordeal, and he came up to me afterwards. He had tears in his eyes. And he said, I w I've been listening to you preach. And he rolled up his sleeve, he revealed a tattoo that said, Lucifer. And he said, I, I did it when I was angry, and I'm sorry. And I prayed with him, and he gave his life to the Lord, and I gave him a Bible, and he stood up on that wall that I had been preaching on there in the, in the street, and he turned to the crowd, and he said, Jesus Christ has changed my life. He said, I can't explain it. I don't know what happened, but I'm a new man, he said. And so sometimes you see salvations right then and there. You don't always. I had uh, gone to Daytona spring break consecutive years in a row, and... Uh, uh, one time I went, and I had already preached there, uh, Daytona Spring Break, maybe two or three times. And there was a church that I was working with. And we went to their worship service before our outreach. And after the worship service, one of the members of the worship team, who was up on stage playing his guitar or bass guitar, he came down and said, Were you at Spring Break preaching last year? I said, I was. He said, I I was out with my friends, you know, partying. And we drove by you on the street corner with my friend. I was on the back of my friend's motorcycle. And he said something to you and you rebuked him. And so he pulled over and came out because he wanted to argue with you guys. And I was there. And so while you're arguing with my friend, I was just kind of on the outskirts. And someone from the church came up and started witnessing and talking to me. And he said, I didn't have any religious background, no Christian affiliation, I never heard any of this stuff before. And uh, I ended up coming under conviction and the fear of God, and I gave my life to the Lord. And I connected with this church. And he said, I've been going out to that same district where you were preaching in that same street every weekend since you've been gone. And he says, if it wasn't for you, I don't think I would have even gotten saved at all. Now, I didn't know about this. I didn't know he had gotten saved. I found out a year later. But you see, there was multiple hands involved. As uh, Paul said, one, you know, waters, one plants, one waters, and God gives the increase. It's a joint effort. Sometimes these Christians on campus will come up and say, this is my campus. What are you doing preaching on my campus? We have our own ministry. We have our own outreaches. These are our people. Well, what happened to this being a joint effort? How about you guys, instead of hindering my work, why don't you help it? Instead of viewing this as a negative thing, take this as an opportunity to talk to people about the Bible because you'll have more people talking about the Bible on a campus when there's a campus preacher than any other time of the year. And then I usually tell them, listen, how long have you been here? Well, this is my first year. So I've been coming to this campus for the past, you know, five, six, seven years. I was here before you got here, and I'll be here after you leave. So this is my campus. <laughs> no. Or sometimes, I, I, like I had a one campus, I had a woman come up to me, and she says, I'm the chaplain here at this campus. These are my sheep. And I said, so you're responsible for this crowd. You're the reason these people are this way. You want to claim some this is your territory, then fine, you take responsibility. Why do these people hate God? Why do these people sin and rebel against God? Why are you doing such a bad job on this campus? It's your fault. Why aren't you out here preaching? Why did I have to do it? So, one time I was preaching at Yale University. Uh, in fact, uh, I've preached there numerous times. I went and I see a lot of the same people every year. Yale is in Connecticut, my home territory, so whenever I go home, I go out to that campus. You know, these are the Ivy Leaguers, future leaders of the world, and you know, a lot of presidents have come out of Yale University, senators, congressmen, all of that. So uh, the future you know, major decision makers, so I like to go out there and uh, preach, because it's a very wicked campus. Uh, they call uh, Yale the Gay Ivy, because of how many uh, homosexuals they have on campus. In fact, uh, they have parties. That I was reading in their Yale newspaper how they have naked parties. And they, you know, they party naked. And uh, you know, they said not even Harvard parties like that. And I thought, well, this must be like some rare thing. I mean, it can't really be like a 
big thing on campus. So I had a crowd of about 100 people. And I said, how many of you have ever been to this, these naked parties? And I couldn't believe almost all of them were raising their hands. Uh, so this was actually, so this is how wicked this campus is. Well, I was preaching and a man came up to me and said, I remember you from last year. You know, how are you doing? And they all know, my, know me by name. And uh, we were talking and he said, now, I, I just, you know, I, I don't think this ministry is effective. I think you need to do friendship. Don't, don't stand up and preach. Just do friendship with these people. That's effective. And I said, well, what makes you say that? He says, well, I mean, some of my friends heard you last year. And they came out and listened to you. And, you know, they're not believers. And they were just, you know, uh, mocking God, mocking the Bible. They weren't converted. They didn't come under the fear of God. They, they didn't give up their sins. They didn't turn to Christ. You didn't win them. I said, oh. I said, these are friends of yours. He said, yeah. I said, well, like, are these like new friends or are these like long-term friends? You've had, like, do you really know these? Oh, I've known them for a long time. I said, so you're telling me you're going to criticize me for not accomplishing in a day what you have been unable to accomplish in years of your friendship evangelism approach. And he tried to move on. I said, do you see my point? He said, yeah, I see it. So there he is doing his friendship approach for years. And he didn't accomplish what he's criticizing me for not accomplishing. Converting his God-hating friends. They say, uh, this is not the way to witness. Jesus didn't do this. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. That's all. He just hung out at the pub with the sinners. Well, Jesus testified of himself in John 7, 7, the world hates me, not just the Pharisees, the world hates me because I testify of it that God loves them. No, nope. nope, I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. In other words, it wasn't just the Pharisees, but the world. And they hated him not for saying God loves you, they hated him for telling them that they were evil and that their works were evil. Jesus rebuked entire cities, not just the Pharisees. Entire cities that didn't repent. And he said, it's more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you. Woe unto you, Chorazin. Woe unto you, Bethesda. These were not just Pharisees he was rebuking, but unrepentant sinners. So yes, Jesus did this. I th people have this make-believe Jesus. This hippie Jesus. It's just a figment of their imagination. I think if these people read the Bible, they would see how biblical not only open-air ministry is, but confrontational, the public rebuke of sin. They say, you're making Christianity look bad. Okay, now they say, you know, the greatest, uh, this is what people say, oh, one of the greatest turnoffs to Christianity is hypocrisy. There's so many hypocrites in the church. It's like, okay, so... They're saying the world is turned off when people aren't taking Christianity seriously. The world is turned off when people aren't really living what the Bible tells them to do. But then they criticize me when, when boy, I'm taking the Bible seriously. Hey, I'm doing what the Bible tells me to do. And that's turning the world off too. So now the hypocrites are turning them off because they're not, they're not actually living by the Bible. And then the preachers are turning them off because they're living by the Bible. You see, it's just, they're, you can't please a sinner. Until their heart is changed, they cannot be pleased by God or by saints. And Charles Finney had a whole sermon on, you can't, God cannot please sinners. You know, if God were to just overlook sin and allow sin to happen, even sinners will say, God's not just, God's not loving. But then if God judges sin and punishes sin, well, then they don't like God either. You see, their conscience would condemn God if he just tolerated sin. But then they don't like God in their will because he tells them not to sin. So until a sinner changes his heart and his heart or his will comes into alignment with their conscience, then they, God cannot please them and neither can we. It's a catch-22. You know, uh, John the Baptist came. He didn't eat. He didn't drink. They said he had a demon. 
Jesus came eating and drinking. They said a glutton and a wine bibber. It was a catch-22. So they're going to tell you, look, uh, you know, this is not going to win us. This is, this is not going to convert us. You're just making Christianity look bad. Well, what we need to be what we need to be concerned with is being an adequate representation of Christ, whether people are offended or not, whether people are converted or not, but to do what God has told us to do, and trusting that He has an infinite intelligence and He knows what's best for this world and He knows how ministry ought to be done. And we do the will of God regardless of the reactions and regardless of the results. We do what God has told us to do in perfect faith and trust and confidence in Him. And I know God has called me to this ministry to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. And I know He wants all of His believers and followers to spread His word. And no matter how much opposition, no matter how many objections are made against it, I'm going to continue to do what God has called me to do. Now the underlining reasoning for all these objections people make is ignorance of the Bible, or the fear of man, or the love of praise and acceptance. The fear of rejection, or more often than not, sin in their own life. They don't want you to preach against sin. They don't want you to call people to repentance. They don't want you to warn about the judgment of God because of sin in their own life. And that's true not only of the unconverted sinners, but that's true of those who are in the church. So there's often these personal reasons why they're making these objections. It's not truly based on reason and logic and scripture but on their own personal preferences because of the sinfulness of their hearts. I'm sure of that. Now there's also opposition from the police and from the authorities. So I want to give you some tips and pointers on how to handle that. The police, uh, of course, they're individuals too with their own you know, biases. And some officers don't mind if you're spreading Christianity, whatever. That's your right. Some officers don't mind unless they get a phone call and someone complains. Other officers, they don't like you because they're God-haters themselves. And I know I've run into a few of those who are obviously opposing me and threatening me because they're offended on a personal level. They're convicted on a personal level. They don't like it personally. And they're abusing their authority. Typically, officers do not come unless someone calls them. Now, if you go out with signs and banners, you're more likely to draw the attention of the police uh, than if you go incognito, but you're less likely to get a, a crowd or get attention. But there's ways to handle the police. First of all, understanding that they are problem solvers. If they get a phone call, someone's complaining, there's a disturbance. They're coming to the scene to try and solve the problem. And so don't from the onset assume this is just a God-hater, this guy is full of the devil, and he's just trying to persecute me. You have to understand, it's his job to respond to complaints. He didn't call the police, some other God-hater did. And so you uh, need to recognize from his perspective, here he comes, people are complaining, so negotiate with the police. Find out what's the nature of the complaint, what's the nature of the problem. Is it, oh, this business, I'm blocking the entrance to this business. So the business called you. Well, let me move down the, the block. Let me move out from in front of this business. Oh, my bullhorn is too loud. It's disturbing the residents. Okay, let me turn my bullhorn down or even put it away. See, if you negotiate with the police, now he thinks he's solving the problem. Say, okay, I'll put my bullhorn away and preach without it. Well, he leaves thinking, I remedied the situation, and you get to keep preaching. If you negotiate for location, I'm not going to preach in front of this doorway or in front of this building. You go down uh, the block or you, you move down a few feet. You know, he thinks he's remedied it, and he will, uh, he will leave content. You know, so you've got to look for a win-win situation there for the both of you. Look for a win-win so you, you can both be satisfied. Sometimes I like to start on a campus or uh, uh, I mean uh, like on a, in a new city on the street with all guns blazing get my big banner get my bullhorn in the t-shirt get all, all get you know start off with my guns blazing so when the police come I have some things to negotiate with 
Okay, oh, you don't want the bullhorn. I'll just put that away. Whereas if I didn't start with it, if I just, if I was, well, maybe there's a noise ordinance against it, or maybe uh, they're not going to like the bullhorn, let me not even use it. Well, now I have less to negotiate with. So I put it all on the table from the get-go. You have more to negotiate over. Sometimes negotiating with the police uh, does not work. And they simply say, listen, uh, this, is, uh, this is against the law. You have freedom of speech until people complain. That's what I've been told many times. Yes, you have freedom of speech. Of course you have freedom of speech until people don't like it. And then it's disturbing the peace. Well, my attorney has said it well. He said, you know, if the only speech that was protected was the speech everybody wanted, then there'd be no need for the First Amendment. There'd be no reason to put it on the law that it's protected if the only speech that was legal to begin with was speech everyone liked. The reason it's on the law books and protecting it is because someone's going to try and shut it down. Someone's going to try and oppose you for it. Now what I have here, what I've made, is a, a card full of legal rulings from court cases and from lawsuits regarding uh, specifically what the right of freedom of speech is. So we wanted to hand these out in case anyone approaches you tonight. You need to be familiar with your rights. Sometimes when an officer asks for my ID, I give them my ID and this card at the same time. So that they, uh, sometimes the officers are ignorant. Sometimes they genuinely think what you're doing is illegal. You're, you're, you're disturbing the peace. This is disorderly conduct and they really think that you're breaking the law. So sometimes they need to be educated a bit more on these issues. See, we have the right to speak even if other people don't like it. We have the, the, I'll even read some of these for you. Uh, first of all, we have freedom of speech guaranteed by the Constitution. We have the right to pass out literature, to preach, to display signs in public areas. We have the right to exercise our religion in all quintessential public forums. For example, streets or parks. Those are quintessential public forums. We have the guaranteed access to streets, parks, and other traditional public forums. And any mere inconvenience to the government will not outweigh, outweigh our free speech interests. Free speech may not be prohibited merely because it offends some listeners. It's a very important one. If you're going to be a biblical preacher, you're going to be offensive to people, and that's your right, uh, as recognized by our Constitution. A city may not consider the listener's reactions when permitting their free speech activity. Hecklers don't have any veto power over a speaker's right. Police must control the crowd rather than arrest the speaker in order to maintain order. Have you ever, uh, you know, some of you street preachers have probably been accused of inciting a riot? You know, inciting a riot has to do with these radical hippies in the 60s who would give speeches about the government and about the system to intentionally incite the masses to go and riot. That was their aim. That was their objective. That was, their, that was what they were trying to accomplish. If I go out there and I preach biblical truth in the hope of saving souls and someone gets offended and gets violent, that is not inciting a riot. If the whole crowd gets angry and turns to violence, that's not inciting a riot because that was not my intention. That's them acting violently. That's them breaking the law. So if the crowd gets angry when I'm exercising my rights, the police are obligated to uh, control or arrest the crowd, not to violate my rights, not to take away my constitutional rights. If they get violent, they're breaking the law. And therefore, the police should deal with them, not me. We have the right to be loud enough to be heard. So if you're going to a place like the bars and clubs that their music is so loud that no one could hear you unless you're preaching with an amplifier, then freedom of speech guarantees that you have the right to be loud enough to be heard. You have the right to be protected by law enforcement if the crowd is offended by what you're preaching and becomes hostile. Permits may not be used to restrict the speaker's right of free speech and permits may not be used as a prior restraint on free speech. And then it goes on to say, don't violate this person's rights 
or we'll sue you and a lawsuit will subject you to pay damages and our attorney fees and since it's a federal case uh, you, the officer or security guard is responsible not only in their official capacity but as individuals as well. They don't have any immunity being officers from this type of case. Now, so you want to negotiate with the police and you want to know what your rights are. So I stand my ground and I tell the officer this is my right this is what I'm doing, this is why it's protected, and what you're telling me is not the law. What you're telling me is illegal. You need to know your rights. And you need to have a video camera going. Uh, officers act very differently when they're being recorded. I've had officers tell me one thing when they're off camera and the exact opposite when they're on camera. Uh, and of course they often tell you turn that camera off and you just say no I can't do that. And they, you know, some officers have said, well, why won't you turn it off? I said, because I'm going to sue you if you violate my rights. <laughs> and I don't want to falsely accuse you in court, and I don't want you to falsely accuse me. I want us to, in court, have the situation on video. And, uh, you know, it's... Yes, dear? There were some states that said you could not film an on-duty police officer. Some of those states have already been uh, dealt with in court and have been uh, handled. Uh, I think there are still some cases that are being uh, challenged. and uh, So there may be some states still where you're not supposed to film an on-duty police officer. In the vast majority of our country, you certainly can. So you need to uh, be familiar with your state and where you're preaching. Um, so you need to get a video camera and if the officer, you know, often the one who arrives at the scene is a low level officer, you know, he's the first uh, responder, uh, his supervisor is somewhere else and uh, sometimes they, you know, might not really know uh, as much as they ought to and you might even try and tell them but they're not listening to what your rights are and so if you're not getting anywhere with them you can ask for their supervisor and, uh, you know, that's their, their policy that they're required if you ask for a supervisor they're they're supposed to to get it get him for you the supervisor is supposed to arrive on the scene and every time I've ever asked for a supervisor I've gotten one and sometimes the officer is more knowledgeable and more reasonable sometimes they know the law they, they're a more experienced and a more educated you know law enforcement officer and uh, that has remedied many situations or sometimes I'll even go to the uh, police department and ask to speak with the chief. Set up an appointment with the chief and tell him this is what happened. This is where I was. This is what the officers were telling me and uh, and what can we do about this? Can you talk to these officers to leave me alone? And sometimes that has helped. Uh, sometimes if you can't get anywhere with the officer or the supervisor or even with the police department as a whole uh, then you can uh, contact some Christian attorneys. Now the Bible says the government exists for our good. Romans 13. They're not supposed to be a threat unto good works, but unto evil. And they bear not the sword in vain. They, the government exists, it says, for thy good. And part of our legal system is that of these, you know, uh, civil lawsuits. Constitutional uh, lawsuits. It's the, it's the remedy that's been given to uh, solve these types of dilemmas. Now, you're not, you're not going to get rich. Your attorneys will. Uh, but we'll be able to defend uh, our right to uh, preach the gospel. Of course, we want to preach whether it's legal or not. We want to preach whether we go to jail or not. Uh, but we're not supposed to want persecution. We're supposed to flee persecution. And uh, the government exists for our, for our good and for our rights. And when I file a lawsuit uh, in regards to free speech, that's for the good of everyone. That's not done out of a personal revenge. That's not done out of a personal vindictiveness. That's done for the public's good, for the good of all. Yes, dear? Yeah, if anyone ha has a situation that you need a Christian attorney, just let me know and I'll hook you up with, with uh, an attorney that would help handle your case. Okay. So you're going to have opposition. You're going to have opposition from the world. You're going to have opposition from the police. You're going to have to uh, have opposition from the church. You need to know how to handle the opposition. If the opposition is verbal, then the way you handle it is verbal. Show them that their accusation is faulty, scripturally or logically. If you're having uh, opposition from 
uh, the authorities, you need to know how to deal with that on a legal system, on a legal basis. So the nature of the opposition determines how you're supposed to handle it. But be familiar with the common objections. Be familiar with the laws so that you know how to address them. And this is especially for those of you who are going to be preaching often and regularly. Expect opposition and uh, know how to handle it. So do we have any questions relating to opposition? Um, yes, sir. Um, I've seen, I've watched many of your videos, and I've never seen you uh, take the approach of casting out demons in opposition to you. Yeah. Is that part of your approach ever? I'm not, I've not seen it. I've had to do that one time. It was incredibly effective. Yeah. But I perceived it was a, a, a demon opposition, a demonic. It was, this guy was way out there. And he immediately... Yeah. When it comes to, you certainly have a lot of demonic opposition in the open air. Uh, I don't always have the discernment. Sometimes you can know this guy is demon possessed. Sometimes, you know, you don't always have the discernment whether they are or they're not. I don't know if it's biblical to cast out every demon. Uh, the Bible says if, the, if one is casted out, uh, you know, seven more could come. And the, the, the latter is even worse than the first. In the book of Acts, you know, this woman, this psychic, was following Paul and harassing Paul for, well, I believe, three days until he finally said enough is enough and cast the demon out of her. But that was like, that wasn't the first thing he did. That was almost like a last resort. It was such, it became such a nuisance that he had to do it. And uh, that woman did not repent as far as we know. She didn't get right with God. Seven more demons could have come later on. And, and now she's even worse than before. Uh, if someone comes to me and, and, and says, I need deliverance, and I want to repent, then, then I will pray with them. In the Bible, you saw someone coming to Jesus saying, my daughter or my son needs deliverance, and, and he did it in, in those situations. Uh, I, I'm open to being led by the Lord. Uh, I have never felt the Lord tell me, specifically in my spirit, this person has a demon and you need to cast them out. There's been times where I felt this person has a demon and I, and I rebuked the demon in Jesus' name and they walk away and leave. Um, but so you, I think we all just need to be led of the Lord. I can't tell you you should always do it or you should never do it or this is when you should do it. I don't, I'm not the specialist on that topic. Uh, but there are a lot of demons that will oppose you in the open air and we need to be prayerful and, uh, and be ready. And uh, if someone, you know, is humble and is broken and repents, then we should, you know, we should uh, have the power of God to, to pray with them and see them through. So. Yes, sir. Do you have any help for family opposition? <laughs> you know, uh, I, yeah, there's, there is family opposition. Uh, Jesus, Jesus had family opposition, and that's the, that's the opposition that hurts the most. You know, like even David said, you know, if it was my enemy, I could bear it, but it was you, my own familiar friend, and, you know, uh, we went to the temple together, and this I cannot bear, David said. And so, you know, the closer the heart the opposition is, the harder it is. Um, when it comes to witnessing to family, you've got to remember family can be a very long-term relationship. And so when I, you know, witness to my family, of course, I, I, they know what I believe, they know what I believe about them, but every time we get together, I'm not, I'm not talking to them about it. I am looking for opportunities because it's a long-term investment. I make the gospel known to them. Uh, I'm not waiting for them to ask me because they might not ever ask. I'm going to try and bring it up. I'm going to try to talk to them. But that's not the only thing we're going to talk to them about. You know, uh, sometimes I think you can be overzealous with your family. And... Uh, you know, so much so they don't want to invite you to family gatherings. They don't want to invite you to come to their, you know, they don't want you to come over anymore. Not that we, now this is different from a friendship evangelism approach. Friendship says you need to become friends with someone and wait for them to ask you. And then maybe years down the road you can share something. I'm saying no, you need to share the gospel with them. You need to look for opportunities. You need to make opportunities. 
But since it is a long-term relationship, and they are, you know, if they don't love God and they love sin, uh, sometimes if you, if you push the uh, button when it's not right, when their heart's not open, it, it, it might not make it better, but make it worse, you know. Yes. Yeah. Very recently, and I don't know enough about it to say much, but missionaries to Muslims um, described uh, another method, method if you call it, of fulfilling the Great Commission. And I will show you the name of one of the main people teaching how to do this, but it's related to going, rather than making people twice the converts of hell or what is that? Mm -hmm. But discipling, discipling and teaching, and finding persons of peace and discipling and teaching, and they kind of enter into a contract with these people to teach them, and then they come to a decision with all of that training and discipleship and conviction of sin and everything mm -hmm. else. So I don't know if that would at all be applicable in such you know situations, but. You know what I'm saying? It's, I, I'm very... No, I'm not familiar. I know, I mean, we're supposed to make disciples, but I, I've always taken that as discipling believers, not, not discipling unbelievers. The Great Commission, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. Yeah. Teaching them, and then baptizing, I don't have it all memorized. Sure. Baptizing in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. I think the order of the scripture actually discusses making disciples. Right. Well, I, I think when you when you convert someone, that's making them into a disciple of Christ. A disciple of, is, is someone who follows Christ. You, I mean, if you're not a follower of Christ, you're not really a disciple. You know, so if you're witnessing to them, yeah, and then they come exactly. to that decision of are they going to follow Christ or not, I just don't, I, I understand what you're, what you're describing. I don't think dis, disciple is the best word for that, because yeah. they're not a disciple until they've decided to follow Christ. Yeah, I'm describing that. I think the emphasis in contrast to the Western view of the altar call, emotional altar call, one moment in time where you become once saved, always saved. It's more in contrast to that than anything else. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of instructing in truth. Yeah. And giving person an ability to make a reasonable decision yeah. towards right. surrendering all. Yeah. And, and that, 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 that sounds more like a, a like a long term one on one witnessing. That's yeah. About and that's what family is. It's a long-term, one-on-one kind of a witness. Yes. Yeah, um, something that I've observed, and it seems to be true in my case, uh, the whole idea of friendship evangelism, well, when you get to know someone, it's actually more difficult to yeah. witness the gospel and not, not less difficult. That's right. Just like you mentioned with your family, with your family, it's more difficult to witness to your family because they know you, you know them, You've known them your entire life. It doesn't make it any easier to get the gospel. That actually makes it more difficult. It's a lot easier to go up to a bunch of complete strangers and say, if you're a drunkard, you're going to hell. If you're, you know, it's a lot easier to do that than to point at your uncle and say, you're going to hell, Uncle Mark. And unless you repent, uh, you're going to perish, Uncle. And it's a lot harder to do that than it is to do to complete strangers. So I'd say yeah. uh, uh, friendship evangelism is yeah. uh, at least two or three times more challenging. The advantage of, friend, uh, of um, family is that they do get to see your life more intimately. And so there is that witness of your life. With me being converted out of such a, a, a wicked life, and you know, that change of life, I think, is a testimony to the power of the gospel for my family. So I've, I've witnessed to them. I tell them, listen, you are going to go to hell. You're sinning. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I was going to hell, and, and that's why I needed salvation. You need salvation. Uh, but, you know, and they get offended. But, but I'm not saying that every time we get together, I'm letting my life, they can continue to see the blessing of God in my life and how good it's been for me uh, that I gave my life to the Lord. And that, you know, the, just the change that it's, it's brought and the blessing that it's brought. And I think that, and, and so there is that example that your family gets to see that maybe a, a, just the average Joe on the street would never get to see. So, what, any, yes? Yeah, um, regarding, you know, I heard this, uh, by some of the preachers regarding, you know, for example, if, when you found like this very strong opposition, you know, people swearing and like, you know, like call them by name or, you know, contrast with sense of humor or, yeah. uh, you know, like, I don't know, is there any other thing? 
I don't know if those are those all the only things that you can, in order to you know reduce the, this, if there's a very strong opposition or kind of you know people. Yeah, it's all that. There's a threat of physical danger to de-escalate. Do you have any de-escalation approaches? Yeah, there's uh, the Bible says uh, a gentle answer turns away wrath. And so, like, when I was preaching in the inner city and those guys said, were threatening to hit me, and then I, I was giving them more of a gentle answer, showing them, listen, I'm, I'm telling you this because I care about you. I'm telling you this for your own good. And they went from threatening to hit me to, to um, you know, wanting to shake my hand. So a gentle answer turns away wrath. Uh, other times, just depending on the situation, uh, you might need to... Sometimes I call their bluff. Sometimes I, I can tell this guy is just acting out in front of the crowd and, uh, and uh, you know, sort of call his bluff. That's the ring time in Jesse Morrell, and then they all start sitting down on the ground. That's the other thing. When the crowd gets really large, they're more prone to hostility. And so when the crowd gets very large, I, I put the, the question and answer aside and will get to you know telling stories because when they tell stories and they sit down first of all sitting down naturally tames them and so they, they be, they're much calmer if they're sitting and uh, and it's less heated because it's not question and answer back and forth so I start if the crowd gets really big and starts to get hostile then I just start to like Jesus told parables and told stories to the masses and that I'll start telling my testimony and telling various stories to illustrate the gospel to them instead of the one-on-one -on -one debates which which get heated you know so is, is this a question oh i had another question if that's okay yes uh at the beginning i i totally agree with where we preach the gospel that comes from the bible effectively that we should see opposition but do you think that maybe some people uh, use that as their sole motivation for going out and and actually maybe even seek opposition, uh, not so much to preach the Bible, but just to seek the opposition yourselves. Uh, do you think that maybe that's a problem? Well, it, it's hard to see someone's motivation, uh, to judge someone's heart. I, I, can, I can think of many different false motives people have for witnessing and for preaching. But that's what Jehovah's Witnesses do. Every time I greet them kindly, they're disinterested and they leave. They're looking for the opposition. So the false preachers definitely are looking for validation by them. Yeah. The now, now, just because you're opposed doesn't mean you're preaching the truth. But if you are preaching the truth, you will be opposed. Right. That's what. I, that's what. I there. Yes, sir. Quick question: Not spiritual, unfortunately. With these rights, I'm not American. Do I still have the same rights to run? <laughs> Being when you're in this country, that's the I that as far as I understand that that these these are this is the law of the land, and you're in the land. If you're here legally, yeah, I I no no even if you're illegal, no even if you're for, even if you're illegal, yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, I'm just saying you're going to be in trouble if you're not. I um I I did put the as an American citizen part, but. I, I knew there might be some exceptions to that. You can always type this out and change it. So. Yeah, Brother Peter, he's from Norway. Every time he comes here, he has no problems with the authorities. Norway. Yeah, that's different in other countries. If you go to Canada, I, uh, as far as I understand, it, you know the Canadians have those rights, but you do not. Well, unfortunately, Canada, most of us don't have those rights either. Yeah. Where are you from? Canada. Which part? Toronto. Okay. I preached in Toronto, University of Toronto. There. My wife's from Winnipeg. Yeah, I've been. I I've was kicked out of Ottawa on the campus there, uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, um, Windsor. Yeah, I I haven't had much luck there. So, I guess there's one church in one church in Calgary that's been having some good legal battles. I guess. But he he lives in the U.S. Yeah, he, yeah. And you, you can go to Stephen F. Austin there in Nacogdoches. So. Okay, so let's take a break and uh, just a five-minute break and come back, do the last session, and uh, get ready for the outreach after that. Yes.
numerous times. They do have a permit process. 